thank you for introduction. Thank you, dear participants, for coming. Thank you for your interest in our topic. And um, if you have any question, you can uh, interrupt me and uh, just ask. I will be happy to answer you. So the scale and intensity of the war in Ukraine uh, resulted in widespread and uh, severe damage of um, one of the most uh, ecologically and economically important areas of Ukraine, agriculture farmlands, and um, the basis of food security. Um, and the war impacting Ukrainian farmers in different ways, in direct and indirect ways. And uh, if you just can imagine, um, oh, sorry, there's a presenter. Oh, yeah. And since the war started, since the war started, since the beginning of the war, Russia has launched more than uh, 10,000 drones and uh, seven, more than 700 missiles and 30 million artillery shots, and all of these have settled into the soil. So it should be mentioned here that before the war, Ukraine had a lot of problems with agriculture, because you know uh, that probably you know that um, Ukraine had the most uh, plowing area, plowed area in, in the world. So the uh, territory of rabbit area is about 40, uh, 54%. And as an ecologist, I am very sad with this situation. And uh, that is why, because we use very extensive method of um, agriculture, that is why during the last 100 years, we have lost almost 30% of our fertile soils. So now um, it can be easily compared with an organism that um, has been exhausted after the long, um, after the long fight against the disease, and it is exposed by new virus again. Virus, as uh, I would say, this war act as a virus for uh, our soil, and uh, uh, it's not only a problem for Ukraine, because as you know, Ukraine has the biggest area uh, covered by black soil, Chernozem, we call it. It's about 30 percent of all. Uh, black soils are concentrated in the territory of Ukraine. And uh, moreover, it's a fully now global food crisis. Uh, before the war, Ukraine fed about 400 million people worldwide. They relied on, our, on Ukraine uh, food supply chains. And the, before the war, Ukraine was the first exporter of sunflower oil and the third exporter of corn, the fifth exporter of wheat. So it was uh, very important for us, for, uh, not only just for Ukraine, but for all people around the world. And if you're talking about some facts about uh, Ukraine, so more than 25% of Ukraine's land as I said, arable land, so you can imagine just how important it was before the war for our economy. And before the war, agricultural sector contributed up to 12% of our GDP, and our up to 20% of GDP with the processing food industry. Agriculture provided employment for 14% of Ukraine's population. And agricultural products accounting for 41% of the country's uh, and uh, gave us about 68 billion in overall export. So you can imagine that it was an uh, important revenue we, that we could historically rely on. Since the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine in 2014, I would say that agriculture also um, showed us consistent improvement and was only part of the country's um, economy that backed the recession. And uh, what we are witnessing now, mine pollution, pollution caused by burning and spilling of petroleum products. Uh, actually, uh, more than 35,000 uh, tons of oil were spilled into our soils due to the Russia missile attacks for the last two years. So also pollution by military waste and other hazardous substances as a result of military action. And, um, you know, um, I should stress that land is, uh, and soil is not a renewable resource. And um, to form one centimeter of soil, it is about 250 
uh, 300 years are needed. And uh, to form uh, 20 centimeters, this can be burned by uh, one missile attack. You need five, six thousand years to get back to the same state as it was before the war. And um, yeah, so I would say that against its will, uh, Ukraine now uh, has become a global test site for assessing the impact of military uh, operations on the environment, including soil. But of course, we are not the first case, unfortunately, in modern history, and we have a lot of different cases uh, where the uh, territory of other countries were damaged by the war, for example, um, territory of uh, Belgium near press still uh, contain about 2,000 uh, tons of um, copper, and the uh, territory of uh, Iraq uh, after uh, after the uh, Iran, uh, territory of Iran after the Iran Revolution contains uh, thousands of tons of um, mercury and chlorine. And uh, after the First and Second Chechen War, about 30% of uh, lands were uh, deemed as polluted. And uh, in France, we have so-called Druze Zone after the First World War. And uh, it contains about, it consists of more than 1,200 uh, square kilometers. And it's still protected um, because it's still dangerous not just for agriculture, but just for human beings to live there. And uh, um, territory of Tokyo was partly uh, damaged by um, uh, war actions. And after uh, bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki, territorial soils were polluted by uranium, plutonium. And uh, we had... Uh, sorry. And we also still have problems with um, former Yugoslavia countries. I mean, very close to uh, Romania, uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia borders, and in Bulgaria, we have um, some soils that contain um, titanium, cuprum, cobalt, cadmium, plumbum, and their concentration, uh, concentrations 400 times more than accessible level. So, and um, um, actually, when we are talking about um, high concentration of heavy metals in soils, as a researcher, we try not to use the word contamination or pollution. Because some of this, uh, most of these actually uh, heavy metals, they uh, naturally exist in our soils. So if the level of contamination is, uh, of, uh, is the level of concentration is not too high, so it's very tricky really to understand either that natural background level or it was a pollution. But and, uh, there is even statement that uh, to a certain extent heavy metals positively influence soil productivity until reaching the upper level when um, plants uh, cannot uptake more useful microelements, and the duration process uh, starts. And sometimes, but uh, I would like to stress that sometimes using uh, mineral fertilizers is even more complicated than war damages. And for example, my colleagues, they uh, conducted some research in Kherson areas and uh, territories um, that uh, adjusted to um, battlefields. And uh, what they noticed is that um, for some territories that were withdrawn from agriculture since the beginning of the war, the concentration of heavy metals were even low, lower than, than it was before the war. So just because the territories were withdrawn from agriculture, and they could immediately start to uh, process revitalization. So, but of course it doesn't reflect this uh, overall situation. And now... Um, Situation that's going taking place in Ukraine, it's something, it's dangerous that everyone should be aware of. Because on this uh, slide, you can see that one third of territory of Ukraine has been mined. This is a size of average country. 
So it's like a third to one third of Ukraine. It's like a, um, one and a half Greece, two to Austria, three Croatia, four Switzerland. So just can imagine four territories of Switzerland mined. And uh, um, somewhere mines are reaching uh, four, five miners per one square meter. The destiny of mine to, to our territory. And um, com mm, complete demining of areas contaminated with explosives will take with very optimistic prognosis up to five, ten years. But other experts say that um, it can take two, three uh, dozens of years. And uh, damages to, to the agri industrial complex of Ukraine now have reached about. Um, 4.3 billion dollars. The total losses of Ukrainian agriculture are estimated at 23.35 billion dollars. And if you want to get uh, to build back greener, build back better, so for now we need about 70.5 billion dollars. If it, it's exactly for agriculture, but. Um, I would like to stress that uh, the mining and soil rehabilitation uh, should be a single process. We shouldn't separate these two processes. And um, because uh, mine explosives uh, lead to uh, contamination soil with different um, heavy metals like plumbum, nickel, strontium, cadmium, titanium. And uh, this makes um, the soil even dangerous and in some uh, cases unsuitable for future agriculture. And um, we had this problem in France because of improper demining. There are, we have still some places where um, the grass doesn't grow because uh, it was improperly demined. So we have to take into account and uh, avoid these bad consequences. And um, uh, actually, we have to take into account that uh, some ammunition and uh, weapons, and so they, um, um, some heavy metals, they just leach from ammunition and weapons into the soil, contaminating it. And a large area also covered by trenches, craters. Actually, the photos that was done uh, that were done by my colleagues from Sumy, the three regions, um, excluding the uh, one in the left upper corner. So uh, the situations that take place now uh, exactly in Sumy, Kharkiv, Chernigov regions. Um, so I would say that uh, soil is like a hidden danger. Even if farmers, what they do now, they just lover. Uh, soils, craters, and they don't understand what is going on inside. They don't want to think. Sometimes they even don't want to take soil samples to understand how heavy metals will uh, affect grain, crops, and so on. And now um, traders, international traders, commodity, food, agriculture traders that are quite um, worried about um, cobalt, cadmium, and other heavy metals that can be uptaken by uh, plants. So, um, and also it can affect the protection of Ukraine. Uh, because you know, for many years, Ukraine uh, had a moniker, a breadbasket of the Europe. And now what we have, it's make dangerous. Even sometimes I would say that, um, and, and as our experiments, they have shown that the situation is not so bad as it is um, told to everybody in the world. So because uh, uh, there are a lot of lobbyists from Russia who would like to exclude uh, Ukraine from the um, agricultural market. They're trying to even exaggerate the situation and to show the worst case that we have. Uh, that is why our uh, aim as researchers is to show the real picture, what we have and uh, how we should behave and what to do and what kind of remediation strategies we have to undertake. And uh, it's a pity that uh, the world has set agricultural sector um, by, back by years 
especially after gains undertook um, made in developing healthy and organic crops. Because maybe you know that um, in Ukraine during the last 10, 20 years, uh, we implemented a lot of projects in agriculture in order to switch to organic agriculture, in order to be a supplier of agriculture, trust, uh, a supplier to whom Europe can trust. And also it's one of the idea of um, uh, joining uh, Ukraine to uh, the EU, so that we have to be a supplier of organic production and uh, use less fertilizers as, as we can. And uh, so how many suitable projects, uh, sustainable projects can be implemented? So from, for moving from Soviet past, extensive agriculture, uh, uh, to this market-oriented way of living, and now we have to think how to survive, how to supply enough food for our people. Uh, and the longer Russia conflict Last, the more insecurity about food supplies it may bring to the whole world. Um, agriculture, commodities, as I said, they worry, and we have to show them, we have to conduct this kind of mapping, uh, monitoring, reporting what we have found in our lands. Uh, and now it's still a great, great important importance to collect all the data systematically, step by step, in order uh, to develop a strategy for remediation, revitalization, our lands, and in order, in order to make Russia pay for all the crimes that they commit in Ukraine. But environmental crimes are very difficult to prove because, uh, for example, um, after the Gulf, uh, we, have, uh, we have had in our history a first um, case uh, when um, Saudi Arabia they applied to court, international court, to reimburse um, environmental um, casualties committed by uh, Iraq. And, uh, but they uh, managed to get just 6.5% from the all sums that they requested, because it's very difficult to prove, to confirm environmental crimes. Um, so, and it's crucial to build uh, capacity uh, to, for mapping, monitoring, and managing environmental risk from critically affected um, by the war Ukrainian agricultural lands. So for that, we should create a network of people, like-minded people, because the territory of Ukraine is huge, it's a, a more than 600,000 square kilometers. So we need a lot of people uh, who would like to join us and probably uh, external experts uh, who would like to help us to solve this problem because it's not Ukraine problem, it's a global problem of food supply. And um, so we have to use all the modern cutting edge technologies uh, like um, geospatial data, UAV survey, uh, ground truth data, soil sampling, and so on, to safeguard uh, food security in Ukraine and, and to help our farmers uh, to uh, rebuild their farms, and not just to rebuild to the previous level, but to help them uh, to choose a more sustainable way, a more greener way, and to create a special to-do list for them with recommendations with, uh, on remediation and how to, uh, become, how to uh, start sustainable farming in the future because we have to think 20, uh, 10, 20 years ahead. And uh, we have to prepare our farmers to uh, provide the uh, uh, farming according to the Green Deal, according to Paris Agreement, according to SDG, and so on. And um, so we cannot wait. Uh, half a year ago, I had a uh, conversation, uh, I had a like, private meeting with Minister of Agriculture of the UK, and when we were talking about the problems and I was explaining what our idea of the project in order to get support from the UK government, uh, he said to me, it's too early. It's too early to think about agriculture. Let's wait, 
let's demine your territory and then we can think about remediation, but no, we cannot wait. Other, we will lose uh, years. We have to now to estimate all the damages in order to develop strategy and start then the next day when the war is end. And, um, and we also need uh, restore and save uh, uh, um, need plan like a Marshall plan for our agriculture because it will demand a lot of money as I have said. So now we, uh, we should begin with uh, mapping farmland to document all hazards and contamination and prioritize land for production, remediation, and probably we will need uh, to conserve some lands that cannot be more suitable for agriculture. And uh, today I'm honored to present project, um, project that I provide as a project manager with my team. It's a, um, a joint initiative of the Royal Agriculture University from the UK, Sumo National Agrarian University, uh, in cooperation with ATH Zurich and Bernard Fachhochschule. So, the project has a comprehensive approach and consists of four main pillars, research, study, mapping, and networking. Um, for drafting Ukrainian land green recovery plan. So yeah, we have very ambitious uh, aim, but we hope uh, step by step we can create this network and we can reach it because we really feel that our, our aim is tangible. And so at the first stage, our researchers, they developed a protocol um, bombing impact on farming vi vi viability uh, protocol have to take cell samples because most researchers in Ukraine they know how to analyze how to take cell samples but they didn't face the problem of craters trenchers so uh, we didn't have problem with heavy metals in Ukraine with how to take cell samples from the craters from the slopes and so on that is why we developed it together with the Royal Agriculture University Protocol for soil sample. We tested it in Salisbury Plain in the UK. We launched also drones um, in order to measure the volume of, of craters. In order to, uh, we also used some satellite data to compare, to be able to calibrate ground truth data with uh, remote sensing data, and. Um, because we need, uh, now we understand a lot of territories are mined and we cannot just take soil samples for that territory. So for those territories, we can use drones in order to understand the NDVA and uh, to estimate NDVA. And uh, some territories are still occupied, so we even cannot use drones for them. So for, that, uh, for uh, those territories, we need to use geospatial data, and we have been working with geos um, geospatial company, Pixel. It's American. Indian company and they provided us with satellite data and uh, we also in contact with Maryland University from the USA and they provide us some available satellite data for our project. And uh, uh, so uh, the next stage uh, we uh, choose uh, three regions for our project. We choose three regions that were previously occupied since the war started: is Sumy, Chernigiv, and Kharkiv regions located in the north and northeastern part of Ukraine. And we took first 20 soil samples in order to um, estimate how our protocol works. Then we um, brought all soil samples here in Bern, and here we conducted. Uh, like a round table, um, we uh, invited in Bernard Fachhochschule, we invited your Swiss Soil Center, specialists from ATH, from BFH, from the Royal Agriculture University, from uh, SNAU, and discussed protocol, made some amendments to that, and shared all our soil samples between different institutions in order to test it by using different methodologies. And uh, in order to um, find the best way, the proper way, and uh, to, add, to amend our protocol. 
Then, um, so all the soil samples were uh, analyzed by cutting edge labs in Switzerland, England, and Ukraine. Then we compared our results. Then we understood what uh, kind of changes we have to undertake for our protocol of soil analysis. And uh, then we took, took uh, more uh, than 300 soil samples. So you can see it's my colleagues, they take soil samples. Now it's more than 280, it's just for three regions, because now we have taken soil samples from Kherson regions. So we estimated 28 bomb craters. Um, uh, yeah, also we uh, sent out some of our uh, protocol, some of our soil samples to Poland for magnetometry. We used nine different uh, methods, uh, starting from PCRF, fluorescent um, spectrometry, atom absorption spectroscopy, um, Raman spectroscopy, and different kinds of methodics that we used to, um, to measure net concentration and mobile forms of heavy metals. Uh, and we have found, uh, within our soil samples, we have found high concentration of antimonium, tin, cadmium, lead, nickel, cobalt, scandium, sulfur, vanadium, copper. Um, some of them are th we are three, five times higher than maximum allowed concentration, according to uh, different methodics, according to uh, FAO, according to World Health Organization, and our uh, internal uh, standards in Ukraine. And uh, in place of explosions of equipment, the uh, PR changes were about 1.2 uh, up to 2 uh, uh, orders. So, some of our findings. Uh, soil's ability determines the ability of for, uh, to form insoluble complexes and prevent plants uptake of heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals located in light soils, they are more accessible for plants. That is, uh, that is why it's crucial to conduct soil structure analysis and investigate heavy metals spread in different soil fractions, as well as provide soil analysis for net concentration and mobile forms. Because, for example, in heavy soils, uh, concentration, net concentration can be high, but uptake level, mobile form can be low. That is why it is not so risky. Uh, the next, uh, sporadic explosives result in minimal damage compared with the places where military equipment is burned. Where all sp uh, spills occur or where there, there are direct military clashes. Um, and also, in addition to explosives, uh, I should at that you notice it how many drones have been launched. And these drones, um, they, um, uh, they have lithium batteries. They are also very dangerous for our nature, for our soils. And there are maybe radiation, radioactive uh, pollution from uh, guided aerial bombs that also are used in the territory of Ukraine. So, um, there are also um, no clear correlation, correlation between concentration of heavy metals in craters, slope, and intact. Because sometimes we could find that uh, concentration of heavy metals in intact was even higher than in, in, in crater. Because um, it's very complicated to predict the level of um, heavy metal spread into the soil. Uh, especially if the soil were, have already been uh, uh, ploughed. Uh, so we have, uh, and we even cannot compare the similar trenches. The similar trenches, similar size, um, trenches that were done by the same uh, weapons or missiles, uh, concentration of heavy metals, they're, they're very different. They vary in the high, uh, high range. That is why now we are trying to calibrate our data and trying to compare in order to be able, uh, if you know, for example, the size of crater, to predict what kind of heavy metals and which concentration we can find. But it's quite difficult. It, it, it will take thousands of soil samples that should be analyzed. And even if we know composition of ammunition, um, 
uh, you don't know how its components will behave in soil. It depends on um, weather, depends on um, soil, and so many factors that affect this. So, uh, and uh, it is necessary. It is necessary to define indicators of soil degradation resulting from war hostilities because for now uh, we have this gradation for uh, non-combatant anthropogenic influence. And now we need to identify the thresholds for values of heavy metals uh, that can still secure uh, uh, agricultural stability of soils. The uh, classification of uh, degraded soils have not been, built, have not been uh, properly developed still, and even in the, U uh, in the EU, they use uh, like temporary decision. Uh, they uh, divide soils for two different groups, like um, healthy or insufficiently healthy. But it's temporary decision, it doesn't work for Ukraine. So it is uh, critical to uh, identify damaged intact points, as I have said, to compare soil sample results, because unfortunately, uh, in spite we have had a lot of, I don't know, dozens of institutions in Ukraine that are dealing with soil sampling, soil analysis, but they didn't have um, backgrounds the ground data, uh, because they didn't just provide this measurement of heavy metals. They provided the measurement of macro and micro elements in, heavy, in soils, but they didn't estimate uh, concentration of heavy metals. And it was uh, offered by uh, FAO, like a very big scale project, um, to create a pub public, um, to, to create available database on soil condition in Ukraine but the project was terminated due to the war. So unfortunately, we don't have, uh, for example, for PUCCRF, we uh, don't have background uh, data for heavy metals to compare with them. So that is why what we can do, just can take the samples intact, the distance of 20, 30 meters from the crater and compare with what we have got in crater on this slope. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. no one of the ground truth or remote sensing data analysis methods gives us a clear picture of the problem. Only comprehensive approach can help us to understand the, uh, the, uh, the scale of the problem and um, to understand the real concentration of heavy metals and uh, to understand the spread in the soil. Uh, and Ukraine is now a giant landfill for developing cutting-edge technologies that, unfortunately, will be required worldwide, considering the political situation in the world. Uh, and we assume that um, we need, uh, taking into account the scale and area, a huge area of Ukraine, we will need our farmers as our helper who could help us to take soil samples and to send to research institutions to, uh, to provide analysis. And we need to develop a kind of instruction for them how to take soil samples, because it's, very, it's crucial how the soil samples were taken for analysis, of future analysis. And we also assume that some territories should be just withdrawn from agricultural production and either conserved or used to for biodiversity issues. Uh, or carbon sequestration, and there are zones of um, artillery du duels or combat clashes like Marienka, Bakhmut region. I showed it on the second picture. Uh, it's a, it was a picture of um, uh, Bakhmut, uh, and you could see how many wonders uh, our land has now. <laughs> and. Um, so, and uh, we need unified methodology for calculating financial losses from soil damage, which must be recognized by international law. Because if you would like to apply for reparations, so we have to develop financial methodology that should be proved and confirmed by 
uh, international rules. And like I would like to, uh, our fund is to end with a like positive moment. The process uh, of soil rehabilitation starts when the um, when we stop using our soil. And some lands withdrawn from usage after the war started that show up us even better results than at the pre-war stage because the lands were just uh, left for um, self-rehabilitation. But we understand that the territory is huge, as I've said, and we need a lot of experts to teach our farmers, to teach uh, them how to take soil samples, and uh, we need um, experts to analyze, to be able to produce strategies for remediation, revitalization, and so on. And our team, with our team, we decided to develop course. We invited the most outstanding professors from Switzerland, from England, from Ukraine. And the first course we launched in a blended format in Ukraine. It was the idea to combine two, um, two solutions. First solution we would like to teach experts, and the second solution was to help our former soldiers, to help our veterans who got back from the war, from the battlefields, and who um, maybe they have some handicaps, a problem with their health, if they cannot get back, and we would like to give them like a second chance to be able to feel that they are needed by our society. Because most of them, they just would like to get back to battlefields and protect our country, but they, because of health problems, health issues, they cannot do that. And we announced our training course uh, for veterans, and we really have got some of veterans, and, but what we, we were very surprised. When we announced uh, our course, um, I contacted my friends from Observatory of Environment and Conflicts in the UK, and just to be our speakers. And they spread our announcement through different organizations. And the next day I was just shocked because I've had dozens and dozens of letters from different organizations. For example, the Halo Trust, uh, FAO, um, UNEP, and so on. They would like to teach their specialist uh, in our institution. And, but unfortunately, for the first call, it was just in Ukrainian language. Um, so that is why we had to reject them. But next uh, call, we know with, we had, it, this course kind of courses can be very demanded. That is why uh, for next course, we would like to uh, involve our uh, experts from the first call who were our trainees. We would like to use them as uh, trainers for the next call to teach next generation. So, so it was like a, a training for trainers. And we have got a very um, intelligent people and very powerful people from different research institutions around the, world, around the Ukraine. And you can see the process. We taught them um, how to provide soil sample, how to analyze by using different methodics, and how to use geospatial data, different programs, how to work with that, proceed and how to work in labs, and how to take decisions at the end to develop the strategy for farmers, and so on. So, and, uh, but our idea, um, it's not just to analyze soil samples, it's not just to um, teach some experts, but it should be like a closed circle. And we would like to visualize our data for uh, government, for farmers, because when we come to farmers and we show these Excel t tables, they understand nothing. They ask us, okay, what should I do? And we have to uh, visualize for them and to explain them what kind of remediation strategy we can offer them. And for that, together with Bernard Fachhochschule in the frames of the project CS Rebuild Ukraine, uh, and here we if I have one of representative of that group. <laughs> yeah, we launched the course. No, no, we launched the project. So we connected um, IT developers with researchers. And now my group dealing with um, uh, up with map developed by uh, actually 
Basel and Jonathan, who works in ATH. Uh, so we are, going, we are trying to embed our data, research data. Just a minute, I will show you. Uh, in the map, it's just like a first example because we have, have um, discussed it just today, this um, idea in more detail. So you can see it will be like a map accessible for experts and for farmers, just um, ordinary users. So you can click the um, point and you can find pictures. It's just a real picture from the farmland, but we're also going to add some uh, geospatial data, pictures, measures, and you can see information about farms. And here you can see uh, submitted, uh, uplo uh, uploaded information for experts with all soil analysis done that, uh, that were done by PIXRF, atmospheric spectroscopy, magnetometry, and, um, and other kind of um, analysis that we can provide. So for now, uh, the, uh, our, the main project idea is to collect all this data from 20 farms and my team, they will visualize it. And then uh, we are going to present our idea to our government in Ukraine and probably some business companies, like we have uh, contacted to Syngenta, they were quite interested in our project to buyer, to other uh, producers, to show what we can do, how we can create this network. And also our idea, this, that uh, together with this map, we can access experts around the world. So for example, if farmer, if community, if someone, uh, a big um, agriculture company, they would like to understand what kind of uh, pollution they have, they can put their data, contact our uh, administrator to uh, submit all the data in that map. And they can contact to external experts around the world. Actually, we have already collected, we conducted a round table with different experts from Austria, England, Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, and we have collected 30, 30 experts who are, who are ready to uh, make this volunteering for us for the beginning. Then it can be a big scale project. And they are ready to uh, when they get in access to all this data, so they can understand and they can help our farmers to develop strategy for land remediation and revitalization. So it's main idea to show this to experts who can recommend something and the other idea just to, for example, if we would like to provide information about carbon sequestration. So, for example, if lands should be withdrawn because the level of contamination is too high, so uh, we can calculate uh, carbon possibilities of carbon sequestration for the farmers and to develop method for generative farm farming. So they can use these carbon credits. And you know, between Switzerland and Ukraine, we have signed an agreement about carbon credits, so also can be an idea. And we would like to embed in this map a financial calculation about losses of farmers, so they also can be used by local government, for example, if they want to, uh, to help farmers um, by subsidies and so on, by credit, giving the credits. Uh, so, and I have been, I have been contacted by um, the head of Ukrainian humanitarian, uh, organization, humanitarian demanding organization, and they promised us to create this uh, liaison with uh, agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture and Environment, because um, it's really can be a big scale project, and at the end of this project we would like to develop a strategy like blueprint for uh, remediation of agricultural land. So it's, we are going also to uh, divide our lands like for several categories, lands that can be suitable for farming, suitable for farming after remediation, and um, lands that should be conserved for, if it is needed. Because um, as experts said, if, land, if soil needs um, more than 15 years for remediation, it's better to withdraw the soil for biodiversity, sequestration issues, and so on. But it's, or provide like 
reforestation. It's quite difficult to, to believe in that because our farmers, they don't want to wait, they don't want to uh, reforestate it and so on, but it can be like an idea or we can um, reintegrate for some livestock these lands. It also can be decision. Uh, and um, we have already been contacted by the Halo Trust and they have special agricultural department in, located in Kiev. And they visited today, we had a meeting today, and I, like, I connected online, and uh, my colleagues have, were on site. And they're quite interested, because they understand that uh, their um, staff, they can um, take whole samples when they provide some work for the mine. In, 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 for the mining. So it can be interesting cooperation between us and the mining organization. And they, we, were, we have discussed taking first 1,000 soil samples after the mining in order to understand which uh, the mining um, technologies um, affect less our soils. So I finished. If you have any questions, Please, I'll be happy to answer. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. I will come to you with a microphone or ask in the Zoom chat if you are remote. Any questions, suggestions? Because yep. we are looking for networking, we are looking for uh, experts who would like to join our team. So, so thank you very much uh, for your talk and for your work, which is nice and needed for sure. So <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, in the very beginning, you mentioned that there was some land in France after, I believe, First World War was demining in the wrong way, and there was land which was not... not they could not use it anymore. So could you please tell uh, what they did wrong and how you can do right the mining, for example, in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, actually, I was not so very deep in understanding what they did wrong. But uh, now we are just trying to understand. It's, it's like a next step, what we would like to, to do with the Halo Trust. If they can provide us different soil samples, like 1,000 soil samples from different areas where the mining uh, took place, so then we can compare which, met met which methods of the mining are um, less affecting. So it's, there are a lot to do still. <laughs> so it means they probably use some uh, methods which you are, let's say, so they're removing mines, but still leaving some, a lot of heavy metals around. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay. So the other question, so you mentioned uh, that there should be some strict protocol to collect those samples, so it's not very easy. Could you please describe, I mean, f yeah, one of example, what, um, what is actually the protocol? Yeah, yeah, we have developed the protocol, so uh, it's from the beginning. If uh, uh, It starts from what expert could, should have. Or expert or just farmer who is going to what kind of protocol, what kind of um, information he should put in, have um, which direction she, he should choose uh, to take soil samples, on which distance he, sh he should take the soil samples, and how it, he should save it, and um, some information if he uh, can use like uh, drones, because now drones. Uh, especially in the area of 20 kilometers from uh, Russia borders, it's just forbidden to use it. And unfortunately, we couldn't use it even for our research. We applied to our um, military government, but authority, but they didn't let us do that. So also how to use, how to compare, calibrate their data with uh, GIS imageries. So it's, uh, all this information, uh, and now um, they're going to publish our protocol to make it um, accessible for um, for society. Okay, thank you. Probably <laughs> the last question for me. Um, so, so you mentioned about this protocol, and the, so basically, it was a big problem to collect uh, samples from big area, 
And uh, so I have uh, an idea, and maybe you can tell whether it's too fantastic or not. So would it be possible <clears throat> to somehow so to take a drone and build some machine on the drone which will collect the sample, and that this drone will set up and they'll automatically, I don't know, fly around in some zones, and they'll land, collect samples, land in, in the next crater, and so on. Mm -hmm. So do you think it would be too complicated to build such, I don't know, a machine and build, mount on the drone, or...? Yeah, yeah, actually such machines, uh, they exist, such drones exist. They can come and take whole samples. But our idea was, it's very clever that you mentioned this, and thank you for your uh, question, because we were thinking about how to combine drone with PixRF. PixRF is like a very portative tool, and how to... Um, uh, to, how to equip drone with PixRF, so without even take, taking soil samples, it can uh, approach soil and uh, provide analysis and uh, then send information to our IT administrator. So it's possible? We are thinking about that, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's thank just, you. It's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to find, it like, can be like a start, good startup. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, um, so uh, if I am correct, you said that in Ukraine the, where, uh, the scientists were not able to measure if there is any heavy metals in the soils. Uh, so you only can measure it uh, somewhere in Europe. Uh, it's because in Ukraine there are no facility where you can measure no, it? No, no, we measured it in Ukraine. Oh, in Ukraine, so, yeah, yeah. okay, maybe I was oh, wrong. No. So in Ukraine also you can measure this. So I was just interested, so you are doing some uh, programs for farmers, but I was thinking, so there are some students, for example, in Ukraine, in uh, uh, geological faculties or whatever, and I think it would be, I don't know, maybe you are doing something like this, uh, it would be very interesting to create some internship which would be funded by Europe, for example, and then students can go and uh, take also analysis of the soils or take them from lands. So do you have something like this? Did you consider? <laughs> Amazing question, and can easily uh, answer you because we have launched this program, master degree program. It is a kind of twinning program, double degree program, but with the Royal Agriculture University in England and Summa National Agrarian University. It's the, uh, sustainable ag agriculture and food security. So we are going to embed all our knowledge obtained from these programs into their program, and it will be taught by a uh, uh, professor from two uh, countries. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think we have something on Zoom. Much of the work you have been doing with physiochemical analysis in situ with PXRF has been pioneered. Have any other countries been exploring these techniques in parallel with what you have been doing in Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. As, uh, that's why I know the problem now is that there are a lot of um, like uh, maximum accessible levels determined for uh, measurements. Uh, provided by atom, uh, AAS, Atom Source Spectroscopy. But uh, for um, PIXRF, for fluorescent measurements, there are not like um, maximum accessible levels. So the problem is the FAO have launched two years before the war, before the war start, uh, the launch program to. Um, to um, to set up these accessible levels for uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. Uh, but this method is quite well used in different countries. I wouldn't say that just for Ukraine. And uh, because it's portative and it's very easy and you can just, you can do provide analysis in the lab or you can provide analysis in, on, on site. It, it takes for each uh, measurement, for each uh, soil samples, it takes about up to three minutes, so it's very easy, and it's widespread. And a follow-on question is whether it has been possible to explore the integrated approach of soil sampling with drone service and hyperspectral Earth observation data. Uh, we, um, actually, yeah, it's our next step. We are going to calibrate our data 
obtained the ground truth data with remote sensing data. It's a huge uh, piece of work, but uh, it's our idea. And now, uh, in December, I visited uh, um, American Ge uh, Geophysics Union Conference, AGU, in San Francisco, and we met some um, professor from uh, Berkeley University and from Maryland University, and, and they um, conduct a lot of research uh, assessing uh, soil samples by using GIS technologies. And uh, now we are starting cooperation with them, and we are thinking how can we compare our data and calibrate and then use it in more um, big scale. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. English is not so good, but I tried. Um, is it possible to say at, at now, at, at this stage, how large the error will be for uh, error to close a uh, polluted area? Can you say how many square kilometers at, at the moment it will be, or it's too early now? Um, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. It's quite difficult to answer. And um, because for now, it's, uh, in Suma region, Kharkiv, Chernigov, we expected to get much worse results. But now we understand that probably only some um, lands in eastern and um, southeastern parts of Ukraine should be withdrawn. But I cannot say about the, how many square kilometers. It's very difficult. We have to estimate it, but just to say, just to to answer your questions, I, it's not a good, not right way. No, it's okay. And a second question is: um, after the destruction of the dam of Khachovka, mm -hmm. um, the soil there is completely destroyed, or is it possible, perhaps in ten or twenty years, to that, that something is growing up or not? Mm -hmm. Or is the black, the black earth is, is gone away to the sea, to the black sea, or is it still there? Actually, the, so the black soil. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, actually, we've got like very interesting, um, uh, very interesting situation in Kachovka because uh, reforestation has been started even um, in more quick ways than we expected. So reforestation, natural reforestation of the areas, and we have got very interesting aqua soils. So they are very wet soils, but they are very productive, fertile for some kind of plants, and uh, they are also quite good for carbon sequestration. So we also can use it, um, like to get additional subsidies for um, and to withdraw the plants from. Um, agriculture and t to use them like for um, biodiversity issues. And I see that we have uh, two more questions here. Oh, those are the old questions. Yeah, can you uh, can you share with us the budget you had for the first phase of the work, and what funding you need to continue for second year? Okay, so we were funded by uh, United uh, by um, uh, International University UK. Um, it was a budget we, for the first part. We had a budget one hundred twenty thousand pounds, and uh, for the uh, next uh, project training for experts, we've got two. 100 pounds, but we still have it, the project is still ongoing. And for the next stage, uh, mapping Ukraine and creating blueprint, uh, you will need about two, three hundred thousand pounds. Much mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Nicholas Meller, thank you for your um, 
question and thank you for your joining us. Nicholas Merrill is a rep representative of LSN company from the UK and he was uh, one of the pioneers of this program who forced us because we were discussing this project for half a year without any results. Every day, not every day, but almost every week we had meetings with our group, Swiss, Ukrainian, uh, English group and we were just discussing the idea, what we can do, but at that time it was so um, unrealistic and he, support, he supported us, he believed in us and now thank you for your um, kind support. So much of you have been done with physical... Uh -huh, yeah, okay, I see. All the questions are the same. Any other questions here? Yeah, so thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one, you said that you need a really a lot of samples to map the contamination. Uh, is it because you really don't understand to the fullest like how the process of contamination is going, or is it because you want to really like go to very dense and small scale grid? Because I would assume that there are already some models and that predict how how fast the leakage it is. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as researchers, we now we are under um, very serious observation, I would say, by different organizations, because they know about our project, like Observatory of Environmental Conflicts and UNEP and so on, and they have requested me several times, please give us your report, please say what is going on, but how can we say, for example, for just having 300 soil samples? And what, uh, it's, it's not re for realistic for um, researchers to make statement. We have to have at least several thousand so samples to be sure uh, that uh, what we are seeing is uh, true. Because um, conducting measurements, it's, we should be very, very precise. And um, as I told you that... Um, a lot of uh, for, uh, external factors that affect soil sampling, like weather, soil structure, and uh, ammunition that were used, and if the land soils were cultivated, generated. So it's really very difficult to understand, and the, we don't know about the state of soil before the uh, attack, missile attack, or, or artillery attack, and so on. So we have to take into account all these external factors. Okay, then from here will come another question. <laughs> uh, so then how do you deal with the uncertainties you have in the research? Because you will never be able to sample every centimeter of soil at every depth. So I, I don't know like how it's handled in such a research. Okay, yeah, for now, as I told you, that we, for the first, because it was very important for us to conduct this, uh, 20 soil samples, first tw uh, 20 soil, um, soil samples in different labs to compare results, how far we are from each other. And then to understand uh, the difference, variety between us, and then to compare our results and to develop the common approach to the soil measurement. But um, I guess we need, uh, as, as I said, at least there are thousands of soil samples. And now, uh, our 26, soil, uh, 26 experts that we prepared in frames of our uh, project, they conduct soil sampling in different regions of Ukraine. They have sent us information from Kherson, from Odessa, from Zaporizhia, from Dnipro. So, and they, and for the next stage, we're going to prepare another uh, group of, train, uh, of experts and they will teach farmers. And so that is why we expect to get this huge pool of people who are ready to take the soil samples and we uh, will provide the soil analysis in our labs and then we can make some like official statements. And if I, must, if I can ask the last question, so uh, you said that uh, you didn't really see a correlation when you tested the samples from the crater, if it's from the middle or from the sides. Are you also testing the grain size distribution of your samples? Yeah, Can yeah. this be related like that? Uh, uh, you uh, have clays, you have sands, and then there is more dissipation and less, and that's why you 
capture release more. We were thinking about that, and some of our uh, trainees they uh, have already done it because it was not like an our idea. We were working just with soils because you need a specialist of another level for to to test plants because different plants they can absorb and they concentrate heavy metals in different parts. Some concentrate in leaves. Uh, and so on. So it's it's a huge amount of work that still should be done, but probably we will need another kind of specialist who specialized on plants. Uh, for grain size, I meant the grain size of the soil. So how how if it's like clay with a very small part? Different. We have different. You have tested it. Yeah, yeah. Yes? We have tested okay. it. We uh, divided in different fractions. Like uh, we tested chernosome, and we tested like light soils, heavy soils, and heavy soils. Uh, it's um, contamination. It's much easier to form complexes. So uh, heavy soils they kind of protect plants from uptake of heavy metals because they form. Uh, very stable for, uh, stable complexes, but not like in so, uh, like in light soils, for example in uh, Oleshkivska um, this is uh, dessert. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Olana, for this insightful lecture and for this insightful discussion. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Now everyone is welcome to continue discussions in more informal way at the opera. So thank you and have a nice evening.